Welcome to the Restituta Orbis channel, and today we're going to be exploring the Hoover Dam. The exploration of the Hoover Dam is going to complete our initial look at the so-called Great American Monuments or Structures. We looked at the Statue of Liberty in the East, we looked at Mount Rushmore in the Midwest, or the West, depending on your perspective, and now we're going to look at the Hoover Dam in the West, or vicinity of the Mojave Desert, near Las Vegas. The Hoover Dam warrants our attention because of its construction timeline. We're going to look at specific details about it, but initially we're just going to take the glance of the Hoover Dam that many people do when they're on tourism in Nevada. When you look at the Hoover Dam, you see that this is a very impressive structure. Would you be surprised to know, though, that the Hoover Dam is actually considered an Art Deco construction? Of course, the other aspect about it is that it was built during the Great Depression, and right now we're simply relaying what is generally well known about the dam. We're also told that because of its tremendous power supply capabilities, it supplies power to Nevada, Arizona, but primarily California, which takes the majority of its power. It depends on what source you look at, and you'll get different accounts in terms of its actual power supply percentages to the states. Yes, no one ever would have thought that it would supply the great state of California, where they decided, so we're told, to build a city in the middle of a desert, that being Los Angeles, as we know the Los Angeles Basin is quite an arid area. Looking at some of the images, though, of the exterior and the interior, we see a tremendously impressive edifice. And indeed, the dam, and I'll try to resist the urge to make dam puns, uh, so much for that. But the dam was designed to provide power, we're told, and it was built during the Great Depression. Yes, another tremendous construction achievement during the Great Depression, because as we know, the United States government, at least, still had unlimited financial resources to conduct whatever projects that it needed to conduct. And for many people, this is the simple explanation for why many of these wondrous edifices were completed on rather short timelines and during the Great Depression. It also explains why the United States was able to quickly shift its focus from the Great Depression to the industrialization of the Second World War by becoming the quote-unquote arsenal for democracy. Many of these images, though, show a very romantic, arid landscape which the dam fills. And you can see that the bypass bridge that we started the video on gives you an idea of how easily you could miss this very impressive structure. Much as with many of the interstates would allow you to miss other wondrous old world structures such as the Iowa State Capitol or the Cathedral or Basilica in St. Paul and Minneapolis respectively because you're speeding along on the highway and you don't bother to look right to actually see the dam or left depending on which way you're going. I always found Lake Mead and the surrounding area in Nevada very impressive, though, because it seems to have more indications with its existence. The dam is extremely unique because of the fact that when it was completed, we're told it was one of the largest dams in the world. And we'll look at the official account after we look at these exterior images. But what are your thoughts when you glance on these exterior images of this Art Deco masterpiece from the 1930s? Yes, a dam that was constructed to be an Art Deco masterpiece. And here I show the different lighting on the dam. And when you consider how the sunlight changes and then you compare that with the artificial lighting that's provided, what kind of visuals does it give you of this impressive structure? And looking at the overall structure of the dam itself, and of course we all are told that this was all constructed with poured concrete. And we'll take a look at construction photos in a moment. It's very easy to realize though that this dam did cost many lives, and whether it was something that was constructed exactly as we're told, or it was something that may have had a little bit more to it than what we realize. And oddly enough, we'll even see that in the official account, which raises questions. It's an impressive structure, and the terrain is rather beautiful around it, at least when you're looking at it, although when you're actually there in Nevada or in the Mojave Desert, you can't help but notice how unrealistically dry it is. It's as though you're standing under a hot air dryer at all times. I'm always amazed at the ability that we had, or at least were informed that we had, to lay out such a structure like this. And remember, it's not just the exterior, it's always the interior. And especially when we come to Art Deco buildings, we tend to get an idea of the size and immensity, but then also the fine detailing that went into constructing such an interior. And while the Art Deco aspects of the dam may not be readily visible just looking at the exterior, aside from some of the towers that we see that are in the reservoir area, when you look in the interior of the dam, it actually provides many different touches of Art Deco. So quite an intriguing structure overall. Intriguing in terms of its construction timeline, 
the wonderful visuals that you look at. And there's a reason I'm doing this video a little bit differently because I believe to fully appreciate this particular structure, you have to see it in live action. And it will certainly give a comparison in terms of how large and give you an idea with the scale in terms of some of the other structures that we've looked at. It'll also make the official figures bounce out a little bit more. This is the bypass that they built, so you could just simply drive right past the dam without really looking at it. And of course, we're told that this is for security reasons. And indeed, it's also for security reasons that there are many areas of the dam that you can't access to this day, where you can see some of the Art Deco images that we will share later. Although, fortunately, we still have photographs, purportedly from within the dam, that will show this. Interestingly enough, this uh, dam, we're told, was a long-term construction project, although actually pulling off the final construction of it didn't take long, as you might think. There's always many different challenges that we don't realize when it comes to building a dam, and you consider what an engineering marvel that this is. The other thing I find surprising, uh, look at that, U.S. Department of the Interior, Bureau of Reclamation. Bureau of Reclamation? Hmm. We have so many bureaus in our wonderful United States government. What a name, though. Bureau of Reclamation. What exactly are they reclaiming? Is it natural resources? Is it energy? Or is it something else? The dam has appeared in many other fictional accounts as well, even in that, well, less than stellar Transformers movie from the 2000s where we're told that the dam was built to house the Allspark. Yes, it's very sad that I actually know that without referencing it. I myself prefer the original animated Transformers movie from the mid-1980s, but I'm sure you'll find that is no surprise. Back to the Hoover Dam, though, you can see it in different visuals, just how complex the layout of it was. What kind of structural detailing and preparation of the terrain did they have to do? How much digging and excavation needed to be completed before they could actually begin to pour concrete, according to the official account? And what exactly was the whole purpose behind it? Of course, we'll be told that during the Great Depression, they needed to provide jobs. And that seems sensible enough on the surface, but why exactly were they not building dams in every state? We certainly had rivers in every state. Why is it they didn't find any good dam site in every state across the Union and simply construct a dam? Imagine how many jobs you would have created. And we're also told that the Hoover Dam has paid for itself over time. So you could achieve that in other states as well as well. Let's take a look at what our friends at the Bureau of Reclamation tell us about the Hoover Dam and the official facts that we have. Again, such an interesting name, Bureau of Reclamation. You think they'd call it the Bureau of Dams or something like that. So the Hoover Dam, where is it? Black Canyon spinning the Colorado River between Arizona and Nevada. And yes, I say spinning rather than spanning because it does seem to be spinning. About 30 miles southeast of Las Vegas, Nevada. How tall is it? 726 feet from Foundation Rock to the roadway. The towers and ornaments on the parapet rise 40 feet above the crest. Amazing that they know exactly how much it weighs. 6,600,000 tons. What kind of dam is it? A concrete arch gravity type. Very intriguing. Also, they don't mention that it's an Art Deco styling, but we'll see that in a little bit. What's the maximum water pressure at the base of the dam? 45,000 pounds per square foot. Very impressive. I'm always reminded of the transparent aluminum that they used in Star Trek IV to solve the problem of building a whale tank on the captured Klingon bird of prey. Yes, I slipped in a Star Trek reference. How much concrete is in the dam? Three and one quarter million cubic yards. Now here's where it gets intriguing. The first concrete for the dam was placed June 6, 1933, and the last on May 29, 1935, so really not all that long to construct it, just shy of two years. Approximately 160,000 cubic yards of concrete were placed in the dam per month. Very impressive achievement. How much cement was required? Now here's where it gets really interesting. More than 5 million barrels. The daily demand during construction of the dam was from 7,500 to 10,800 barrels. Reclamation had used only 5,862,000 barrels in its 27 years of construction activity preceding June 30th, 1932. Wait a minute. What exactly are they saying here? That there was construction that was going on prior to 1932? I mean, that's what the sentence seems to indicate to me. What are your thoughts on this? Let me know in the comments. And I'm willing to accept second and third hand sources of information for this particular exploration. If you have a grandfather or relative who worked on this dam, let me know. Well, it's really the story behind this. Reclamation had used only 5 million barrels in the 27 years of construction activity preceding June 30th, 1932. Once again, it seems like we have a conflicting account here. 
What was an unusual feature of the Hoover Dam's construction? The dam was built in vertical columns of blocks, and we see an image of it over here, that varied in size from about 60 feet square at the upstream face of the dam to about 25 feet square at the downstream face. An estimated 215 blocks make up the dam. So very impressive, and yet in most of the images we have many other questions that we would ask. What were the principal items of work? More than 5,500,000 cubic yards of material were excavated and another 1 million cubic yards of earth and rock fill placed. By feature, this included excavation. So we have 1.5 million cubic yards for the diversion tunnels. For the foundation of the dam, 1.7 million cubic yards. For spillways and inclined tunnels, 750,000 cubic yards. So we're moving a lot of dirt here. Well, perhaps they just should have called the good people of Seattle since they had a lot of experience with regrading and moving hills, and the good people of Boston who were able to do it long before heavy machinery was even invented. What were the qualities of principal materials used in the dam? The principal materials, we have reinforcement steel, 45 million pounds, gates and valves, 21 million pounds, plate steel and outlet pipes, 88 million pounds. Just throwing these numbers about at this infinite amount of material as though it was really no issue, and perhaps it wasn't. Perhaps during the Great Depression, they had great logistical planning. They just had some rather questionable aspects about uh, how they documented this, especially in the fact that we have no chronological record of photos. What construction work was necessary before operation started at the dam site? Again, they constructed Boulder City to house both government and contractor employees. Well, why not? You need to build a city before you can build a dam, and you can go to Boulder City to this day. We've got a really nice breakfast cafe there. Construction of seven miles of 22-foot wide asphalt surfaced highway. So build a city, build a highway. Easy. Construction of a 222-mile-long power transmission line from San Bernardino, California, which it should be noted, Southern California is the main target of the power that this dam produces, to the dam site to supply energy for construction, and then ultimately to supply energy to Southern California. That still needs it to this day. At least that's what we're told officially. Well, let's take a look at some of the images that we have of the dam construction in the interior. The images that we see show a very tremendous and impressive layout with a large volume of space. And indeed, this does conform with the report that we had with the amount of excavated material. Yet these images paint many different pictures and perceptions that we could have of the construction of this very impressive edifice. Now, as I said earlier, there's no doubt that many lives were lost in either the construction or perhaps the re-establishment of this particular dam. Or perhaps I should use the word reclamation. Why, again, is it the Bureau of Reclamation? And isn't it intriguing that we even have a Bureau of Reclamation? I mean, if it's supposed to be about the conservation of natural resources, call it the Bureau of Conservation of Natural Resources. It's also odd to me that, once again, we don't have a very well chronologically ordered account of the construction of this impressive edifice. Once again, we're to believe that we had the ability to plan out and execute the construction of this very complicated dam, and yet, for whatever reason, we could not properly organize a true, well-documented account where we have images, video, and everything that's in chronological order. I mean, I can certainly say that one of my favorite examples, the 801 Grand Building in Des Moines, Iowa, can actually find time-lapse video that shows it being constructed over two years. I also saw it, so it's not to say that I don't believe that we could have constructed this particular edifice. I just find the account very problematic. And maybe we could just say that's because of limitations in the records, or it goes down to that old conflicted account that, yes, we don't want to disrespect our ancestors in the past because they could achieve these great things. They just didn't document them very well. You know, we hadn't figured out the internet yet. We didn't have the ability to store and archive records. We had them move from one building to the next. And then, of course, those buildings tended to burn down for various reasons unknown, or somebody dropping a cigarette or being irresponsible in the basement of said building. We do see in the images, though, some of the heavy equipment that was used in the construction, reclamation of the dam, as we'll say. And it does give us clues, though, that there was a lot of effort that was put into this. And as I said, I had no doubt that there were lives that were lost in this effort. Now, I'm certainly welcoming any of you to share the information that you have about the Hoover Dam in the comments. Once again, it's another project that occurred during the Great Depression. And, of course, the governments always have money, no matter what the economic situation is. And, of course, that's never questionable because, as we know, in most of the government establishment charters across the land, they have the ability to simply create finances or supposedly direct them. Now, we're not going to get into a complicated assessment of money. We're simply talking about the proposed difficulty of the financial situation. 
We're also told that this dam was a long considered project in the state of Nevada. And yet at the same time, they decide to actually execute it. And by the way, they built this during the same time frame that they were building Mount Rushmore in South Dakota during a time of greatest economic hardship in the nation's history. Indeed, this image here shows us how they supposedly poured the concrete in these large cavern areas or these large blocks that they built with framework. Isn't it interesting, though, how that always seems to be the account? They build these large blocks, they frame them, and then they pour the concrete in them. I'm not questioning that. I'm merely saying that seems to be a very well-known and used technique of construction. And it does make a lot of sense from many different perspectives. Do you see any issues with some of the images that we're looking at? Is there anything questionable or does it seem to line up? Again, the biggest point of concern that I have is just the fact that we don't have a nice, well-ordered chronological account. Perhaps there's one out there. I was almost expecting to see on the Bureau of Reclamation site a simple video with images and actual video because, you know, we did have the ability to take video in the 1930s, even the early 1930s, that would document this colossal project. You would think that the completion of this dam would certainly be national news. We're told that it was. But would the people who were suffering the effects of the Great Depression, who were working the fields in California, since many of them came from the Midwest during the Dust Bowl, I'd even received a question in terms of how accurate I think the Dust Bowl was. Well, the Dust Bowl is probably what we're told it was, but the causes behind it are certainly up for debate. Ah, there's the great man himself, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, pointing at the dam and being assisted by his aide, because, as we know, he was confined to a wheelchair. But yet, through the good use of photography and video, a lot of people aren't even aware of that little historical fact. Is it a historical fact? I don't know. It's safe to say, though, that Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected president four times, and no one else has shared or will ever share that distinction in the United States. Here's the construction of the bypass bridge. Again, we're told that the whole reason that this occurred was for security purposes. We also have the wonderful account of all the individuals who came to work on this dam out in the middle of the desert. And I'm always intrigued by the fact that we have all these accounts of these wondrous engineering projects that just happen to really be out in the middle of nowhere. And everyone will tell you that the Mojave is the middle of nowhere. There's a reason why there's some of the largest United States military bases that just happen to be west of Las Vegas in the Mojave. And you'll have the major branches represented, minus the Coast Guard, of course, but who knows. There could be a Coast Guard station on Mono Lake way up there in California. I'll stop joking. The thing about the images, though, is we do get an idea of the colossal effort of construction that went into this. We also see some of the machinery that was available and the heavy machinery that was available. What I find intriguing about that is we consider the amazing buildings that we had built, name any state capital that was built in the 1800s, whichever one that we've looked at in the past, and you have to compare and contrast that with this construction of the dam. The other aspect of the Hoover Dam that I find interesting, oh, isn't this nice, all these dignitaries riding around here in this particular piece of construction. Yes, isn't it a fine time to be riding around looking at this marvelous dam? We do have some intriguing plans of the dam, although I have to say some of the schematics that we have seem to create more questions. There are some very fine details with it. And yet, in other aspects, there seem to be things that are hand-waved. And, of course, the reason we'll get for that, again, is security concerns. This is a major piece of infrastructure. This is critical to power supplies for the southwestern United States, and nobody debates that. And yet, at the same time, there's so many questionable accounts with this particular dam. And you can see that with the effort of construction that went into it, it would make a little bit of sense, especially in the 1930s, that if there was something out there that they decided to reclaim, Perhaps that would be the time to do it. And indeed, it seems as though the 1930s really was a time of reclamation. So perhaps this Bureau of Reclamation could have been more active than we truly realized, in addition to all the other wondrous government programs that were going on during the 1930s, which were told were essential for our survival. And if you were an individual who questioned these particular government programs, well, you tend to be ostracized in any manner of ways, whether you're a military officer or or you were involved with a corporation, a politician, or in any way, shape, or form. It seems as though they did a very good job of creating a consensus in the 1930s, despite the economic hardships. Some of the other images that we have, though, show the cavernous construction and all the amount of material that was allegedly being moved. Of course, we can always say that many of these images, are we really sure that this is from the exact site that we're looking at? I'm not questioning that. I'm just saying, how can we absolutely verify unless we were really there? The 
interesting images that we have though that show the fine-tuned construction of the dam itself always create more questions with how they actually poured the concrete. I would certainly love to see some more photographs that show the actual pouring of the concrete. We're told that was a very arduous process and indeed that's where many of the individuals who unfortunately lost their lives in the construction or reclamation of this dam where that happened. Now let's transition to look at some of the interior images and remember we're told that this dam is Art Deco, although a lot of people aren't aware of that and I certainly had no idea that the Hoover Dam was actually Art Deco. Yet you have these interesting, almost dare I say angelic figures that greet you when you arrive at the dam. We're told that there was some sculptor that was involved in this, but once again these seem to line up with what we think of as Art Deco. You also consider the numerous accounts of how this dam appears in many different video game franchises in the aforementioned Transformers franchise. It is a very well-known landmark. And yet, not many people are aware of the fact that on the inside you have some very intriguing symbols, which always seems to accompany anything that we see that's labeled as Art Deco construction. Yet, oddly enough, the symbols aren't traditionally what we think of as the classic American symbols. Just getting an idea though of the size and scope of these generators and we also have to look at other dams because we did come across the Keokuk power plant back in Iowa which at the time was the largest dam and here's an example of one of the initial symbols. Very odd, this is not exactly a symbol that we consider representative of the United States. You would think this being the 1930s and everything being under such hardship with the Great Depression, we'd want to have some more recognizable American symbols, you know, the wings of liberty that never lose a feather, and instead we have this very interesting, I don't know, dare I say diamond or unique uh, design. We also have these strange angelic figures. I mean, are these to represent the spirit of America persevering during the times of economic hardship with the Great Depression? Turn to the government, the New Deal will save you. I mean, is that what it's supposed to represent? Very odd, very strange, because these aren't symbols that we tend to see in other locations unless we're looking at Art Deco. The other interesting aspect about some of the symbols that you see, such as this one, is that while it seems to be on a very well-built, is this a granite floor, is this the concrete? Not sure, is this some other advanced polymer? I don't know. You can't access a lot of these symbols because, as we said, a lot of portions of the dam are closed off. Just looking at some of the scale, though, of the interior construction, and once again, I know you're going to be surprised, we have virtually no images that show the interior construction. You just really don't need to see those, because if you have exterior photos, you can simply assume that everything went off on the inside. That seems to be a recurring theme that we have in these explorations. The other dizzying aspect with looking at the interior of the dam is you see some of the complexities. Now, some people may say that we have interior construction photos. Wait a minute. What is that? Is that the glaive there from Kroll with a big maze or labyrinth around it? And we can get some of the impressions of the Art Deco construction with the unique symbols. And indeed, in other reliefs that you see across the dam, you'll see the usual array of symbols that don't tend to make a lot of sense, at least from our direct perspective. Look at that, the power individual there flexing the muscles. And once again, we have another idealized human individual depicted here. They died to make the desert bloom. <laughs> well, maybe it should say, they died to make Southern California bloom. And I don't say that with any sort of disregard for the needs of the individuals in Southern California. It's just intriguing to me that we have this dam in Nevada, but it supplies power to all the Southwest. And again, I'm asking why not just build more dams in the other states. They could have created more jobs, and then the dams could have paid for themselves by the power that they produced. But I don't know. It's just, just a question for me. You know, I'm not in government. I'm not a politician, and I'm certainly not representing any corporate interest. But look again at the elevator here, and we see this same Art Deco. And that's the aspect that you'll tend to miss if you don't really get on the inside of the dam. And it's challenging to look at the inside of the dam because of security concerns. We have these large caverns and passageways, and we also mix this with the symbols that we see that paint a different picture than what our initial impressions might be of the dam. For example, here we have a sprocket with a very intriguing symbol all around it. Now, of course, we have the usual artwork explanation behind this, and that was the very crux of Art Deco, or so we're told. There's also the aspect that a lot of these symbols are still in the dam, but you can't actually access it. You can only access it in one of the tourism-only areas. Very interesting. So is that really what's in the dam? Or is that just what we're being shown that we're supposed to believe is there? Whatever the case, these symbols are very unique and they seem to give a different account than what initial impressions would give of the dam. And if you ever get to travel to visit the Hoover Dam in person, and I recommend it even with the arid climate of Southern Nevada <laughs> and Southern California, 
you'll find that you'll have many more questions. Even just looking at the exterior of the dam from any perspective, it creates many more questions. Because it goes back to the question of if we were capable of doing this during the greatest time of economic hardship in the United States history, why didn't we build more dams? In fact, why aren't we building more dams now? We're told that the United States economy has done exceptionally well despite the challenges of the early 2020s. And now that the United States economy has recovered and we're told that we have power shortfalls, we have infrastructure shortfalls, why don't we just simply build more dams? We could create more jobs. We could even put really cool symbols all over the dams and cause other questions. But for some unknown reason, we just don't do this. And there's a variety of explanations for why we don't. We don't have the political will to do it. We just don't desire to do it. We have too many safety standards. Or we have other expenses that we have to attend to. I won't even say anything about the conflicts that we're supporting, whether it's materially or financially, or in all cases, both as it tends to be. But how was it that during the time of greatest economic hardship the United States has ever faced, it managed to complete, in a very short amount of time, an impressive work of infrastructure? An impressive work of infrastructure with wondrous and inspiring Art Deco decorations, maybe that's what Art Deco really is, Deco decorations, inside and outside of the Hoover Dam. What are your thoughts of the Hoover Dam? And by all means, let me know what you think in the comments. Thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Flying over the beautiful terrain of South Dakota, eventually you'll come across an incredible granite mountain. A mountain that we're told the Native Americans originally called the Six Grandfathers. Now sits upon it one of the greatest monuments one of the most recognized monuments of the United States. Today we're going to explore Mount Rushmore, this very impressive monument. And yet, as I said, the Native Americans originally called it the Six Grandfathers. We're told that the Six Grandfathers represented the four cardinal directions and above in the sky and below in the ground. What is the reality behind this particular monument? Why is it so impressive and why does it warrant our attention? Have you ever taken the time to carefully appreciate the details of Mount Rushmore? You can see that there are very human features on these large depictions of four U.S. presidents, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. When you look closely, you see very human features that are impressively conveyed on these incredible sculptures, or however you want to say that they are carved into the granite mountain with the very beautiful eyes and the very shining facial features which somehow seem almost lifelike and yet there are so many different dimensions to Mount Rushmore that we have to consider. Why does this monument glean such attention from the alternative research community? It seems as though there are many accounts behind it. It's also yet another edifice or monument that was completed during the Great Depression, no less, that somehow managed to acquire funding, and yet, of course, had no shortage of laborers. South Dakota is also interesting, as is North Dakota. Two rapidly settled and populated, what we're told are relatively arid areas, and yet both these states grew very quickly especially at the start of the 1900s. And you'll find many old world structures across the towns and cities of both states. Yet South Dakota has many other mysteries within it. Nonwithstanding the amazing monument of Mount Rushmore, but also the Badlands. We're told that the Badlands were originally the bottom of an ocean, and yet they seem to have many other mysteries behind them. They seem to reflect the remnants of something else. Well, let's begin our exploration. I'm no, I'm no sorcerer. But I'll gladly, but I'll gladly test, test your steel. Old friend. Old friend. So where would we put Mount Rushmore? What exactly is it? Is this really a monument from our fifth contemporary era? Or is it something that's a remnant from our fourth era? This channel, we have the five eras theory, and we start with the foundation eras, or the first three eras. Legendary times when there may have been giants and structures that reached all the way to the top of the clouds. And at the same time, we have many remnants which may be seen in the terrain. Then we have our Tartarian era, our fourth era. And that was the civilization that existed before ours. And then our current civilization, the fifth era. 
Now, I'm not going to posit a final conclusion for where Mount Rushmore may be. Was it before or after this time? What we consider the last reset between the fourth era and fifth era civilization. Let's consider our mainstream account, and I'll let you be the judge in terms of what we have. Mount Rushmore was constructed by Gutzon Borglum, 1867 to 1941, an American sculptor, a mason, and also a member of the Bull Moose Party, a supporter of Teddy Roosevelt. Yet, he almost seems like he's the sculptor version of E. Townsend Mix, one of the many architects that we've looked at. Let's look at some of his works. Here we have General Philip Sheridan from the United States Civil War, and we notice that in this much smaller sculptor, or sculpture, we don't tend to see the detailed facial features that we see in the side of Mount Rushmore. Now, certainly we can attribute that to the fact that there were many more people working on Mount Rushmore. It was really a national effort for a national monument. Yet we look at some other sculptures that Borglum designed and constructed, such as this of what's supposed to be North Carolina soldiers, apparently during the Battle of Gettysburg. And yet we don't see the same detail in the facial, facial features, and we don't see the same life in the eyes. And what exactly is with this contradiction that we see? Well, again, we can explain it away. Not as much effort was put into these. We even have a Borglum sculpture of Abraham Lincoln, the great president of the Civil War of the United States. Yet, oddly enough, this particular facial construction does not remotely resemble or match the beauty and grandeur that we see on Mount Rushmore. So it seems as though Borglum had his greatest project within Mount Rushmore. And yet you look at other sculptures behind other buildings with other prominence to them that Borglum designed and created, and it seems as though none of them really match the grandeur or the lifelike qualities that we see in Mount Rushmore. What's really the story behind this? And what are your thoughts? Is it just because he had more resources, more time, and more individuals helping him? We have many other sculptures of Borglum that are featured across the nation. And yet, despite his interesting early life, he's not so well known now. This is very interesting. This looks like it's a symbol from the Pan American Exposition. John William McKay. But what really, really comes down to with Borglum, though, is that his other main project was the Confederate Memorial in Stone Mountain. We have looked at this memorial before when we explored Atlanta, and we see that this is really more of an inscription or a representation of three Confederate leaders, the President Jefferson Davis, General Robert E. Lee, and General Stonewell Jackson. And indeed, it's very interesting to think that Borglum, who what we're told was a Mason, was also affiliated with the Klan, that organization that has three Ks in it, because they were the ones who were really funding this particular monument. And we're told that Borglum was the true designer behind this monument and that he started constructing it. Very interesting that when you look more closely at it, you notice that all the horses seem to have their ears pinned back. And that's usually a sign that a horse is either feeling aggressive or it's in a situation it doesn't like. It's very intriguing that that was allowed to be put up on this great monument, but here it is. We're told that Borglum had a division between the clan and the funders behind this particular monument, and he wasn't around to finish it. And off he went on to start the main work of his life, Mount Rushmore. But it is intriguing when you look at all these accounts and all these organizations that our entire society is made up of, which ones tend to be in favor and which ones don't. And we certainly know that the Klan was never in favor, although we're told that Birth of a Nation, a film in the early 20th century, supposedly brought them in favor. When we look at the main work of Mount Rushmore, very slowly within a photograph, we can see that there are the great lifelike features. Whether it's the facial features that seem to have been so well captured, such as the furrowed brows or the brightness within the eyes. And yet, when you look at the actual timeline, we're told that the idea for Mount Rushmore came about in 1923, from a historian, no less. And by 1927, Borglum was on board, shortly after Stone Mountain, or once he left it. And then by 1941, they had completed the carvings. Now, we're told that this was supposed to include not just the faces, but also the entire busts or the chests of the president. And indeed, the only one we have is George Washington. The other presidents, we just have the faces. And on the left and right in this photograph, you can see what the expectations versus the reality are. 
What exactly are your expectations if you've been to Mount Rushmore? How large do you really think it is? Well, it's intriguing to me that the reality photo is because of the fact that you really can't get that close to it, at least at that point. When Borglum began his design, he certainly had no plans, he just made a model of it. Plan schmlans, he didn't need any plans, he could just simply conceptualize it and build a smaller model. Now, of course, much like we see with every old world edifice that we examine, the model does not compare with the reality. And indeed, none of the models, to include the current one that you can see, remotely compares to the lifelike features of the actual sculpted faces of the four U.S. presidents that are in Mount Rushmore, or the Mountain of the Six Grandfathers, as the Native Americans called it. Indeed, the Native Americans saw it as an affront to their, dign their collective dignity and yet another insult by a government that had betrayed them and led them through a terrifying time. This is supposedly what the Six Grandfathers, or the mountain that Mount Rushmore would be carved on, looked like prior to any figures being carved. And we're told that it is composed of granite, and we have no reason to doubt that. And if you've ever been in, through, and around either the Black Hills or Custer National Park within South Dakota, you can get this entire impression yourself. Although I'll correct myself to say it's actually Custer National Forest is the official title. And here we have many different photographs of the alleged construction or sculpting of Mount Rushmore. And here it already looks like President Lincoln's face is nearly complete. That's indeed what we're looking at. But let's look at some of the other images. And here we can supposedly see some blasting. We're told that it was a variety of techniques, whether it was just blasting with dynamite and then fine carving with individual tools. And we do have some images that show that. And I do believe that we did have the technological capacity at the time to construct this monument. What I find really fascinating about it, though, is just the incredible lifelike detail that we were able to achieve in these four faces that we have. Now, there's some other theories by other alternative researchers that suggest that perhaps there were more faces on the side of Mount Rushmore, or even perhaps that the faces were covered under the rock and they had to be unearthed. Now, I don't know, I didn't witness the events, but you do have images such as this, where we see George's face being completed first, and a rather strange image to the left of it. Now, we're told this was supposed to be Thomas Jefferson, and that this was an aborted attempt, because this particular sculpture of Jefferson just simply didn't work out. So they blasted it off the side of the mountain, and began again by carving other features. Some of the close-up images definitely create more questions and answers once again with Mount Rushmore because it gives you the impression that in every single photo, much as we've looked at in many building construction photos, that the sculpture itself is already completed and that really what they seem to be doing is either clearing or cleaning. Now, that could just simply be the phase in the photos that's happening. But what I always found interesting is that we don't have an actual better documentation. People enjoy saying things are very well documented. Well, why do we not have a more well documented account of the construction or the sculpting of Mount Rushmore? Why do we not have a day one photograph through a day 1000 photograph? Just for an example. Now, of course, I know it was many more than day 1000 as we're talking 14 years, but still. It's rather interesting to think that we do have these kind of detailed photographs, and I'm showing them in their original aspect, and I'm not trying to pan or scan too much in these particular photographs so you can appreciate them as they originally were. But yet, it again seems to give a bit of a conflicting account. Now, here we do have one of the tools that we're told that in conjunction with dynamite is what facilitated the actual construction. Now remember, we have different accounts. We have an oral account, we have a written account, and then we have a pictorial account. And what I was saying earlier is that I'm lamenting the fact that we don't have that pictorial account where we have day one through day a thousand. Why don't we have that? Or even a picture that was taken on every single month documenting the construction. Indeed, one of the questions I had answered is you can find video footage of the construction of the 801 Grand Building, that's the main building in Des Moines, Iowa, and you can see how it was constructed from bottom to top. But yet, for whatever reason, nobody wanted to document this massive undertaking during the Great Depression, no less, where we're told that many people were looking for work, and we have these jovial fellows here who were happy to work on the construction of Mount Rushmore. We're told that many of the workers suffered scarring on their lungs from the fine dust of granite due to all the dynamiting. And I have to wonder what exactly were they doing so close. 
In some of these other images, it again portrays a conflicting account of how the construction proceeded. And yet, there's never any good answer for why you don't have a well-documented, well-documented in chronological order sequence of photographs that would show you exactly the development of this monument. Now, does that necessarily prove anything? No, but it does seem to generate more questions. Those questions behind the fact of why would something that was such an exceptional national undertaking, during the Great Depression no less, and you would expect would be something that the government of the United States would want well documented, was not very well documented. Well, perhaps it was just another one of those mistakes. You know, the government tends to vary in terms of its competence. Sometimes it's hyper-competent, other times it's hyper-incompetent. Speaking of that, take a look at this particular photograph. And again, we see this image of this other face that's next to George Washington. Again, we're told that it's supposed to be Thomas Jefferson, and that because it didn't work out, or for whatever reason, it was aborted and then blown off the side of the mountain. But what do you think's the truth behind this particular image? We also have conflicting images that tend to show us the quality of completion behind George Washington in various states of completion. And again, this is why I'm lamenting the fact that we don't have a more precise chronological ordering of all these photographs. Because again, it seems to create more questions than answers. It causes us to search for other explanations. Now here we see the completed and sculpted head of George Washington with Thomas Jefferson in its proper position on the left side. I'll also mention something else. There is this aspect in terms of protocol and in military parlance called the position of honor. Now the position of honor means that the highest ranking or most esteemed individual is always on the right. You're standing on the right as you face out. So why would there ever be a figure carved to the right of George Washington, the first president of the United States, and by order of the United States will always be the highest ranking military member to have ever served in the United States Armed Forces. There should never be anybody ever to the right of George Washington, unless they just conveniently forgot it during that particular time. When you look more closely, though, at many of the images, you can get an idea of just how detailed they really are. You can see that every lock of hair and the shining in the eyes and the details within the nose, looking closely at George Washington here. Now, are we to suspect that this was all done just with the chiseling or the machine chisels that they did over time in conjunction with dynamite and they were able to achieve this level of precision and this lifelike quality. Here we do see a stage where it seems that George Washington and Thomas Jefferson have been completed and they have yet to begin Teddy Roosevelt or Abraham Lincoln. A very interesting and again conflicting account with how they actually constructed this because you would expect that they would be working on all four at the same time. We're told that they had quite a large number of workers and again remember that this is during the Great Depression. Here in this particular perspective photograph we can see the exact details of George Washington's hair as it goes past his ear. And it should also be noted that George Washington is the one individual that does have the bust constructed on Mount Rushmore. Ah, yes, looking up uh, Thomas Jefferson's nose here, but the reason I show this photo is that it does give an idea of what kind of detail we have under the actual sculpted image of Thomas Jefferson looking up. And you can see that all the details, the lips, the nose, even the eyelids, are very well depicted. For some reason, this image reminds me of something, and what is that? I am washed. Ah, yes, of course. Okay, okay. I'll get back on topic. In any event, there are so many different conflicting accounts and so many questions that we have with the construction of Mount Rushmore. The lifelike quality of all these faces, every single detail that none of the previous sculptures that we looked at from Borglum remotely compare to it. And keep in mind that the previous sculptures were all human-sized, and yet these are colossal in comparison. When you look at different perspectives, you can see some of the fine details within the faces and the fine features within the nose and the eyes. These aren't exactly easy details. And indeed, you can certainly look in recent history behind computer-generated imagery and the progression of how difficult it was to actually depict details of the human face and fine hairs in computer-generated imagery. Here in this early image of Mount Rushmore, or the Six Grandfathers, we have the rock faces that's being dynamited. Yes, apparently that's how you do fine precision work to build faces with human-like features, is you just dynamite it. And then you get in there with your fine sculpting tools, and after a bit of time, 14 years, you can suddenly carve out faces from solid granite rock face. Now is that what really happened? 
Did they really construct these faces from scratch, as we're told, from 1927 to 1941? Another remarkable achievement during the Great Depression? Or was there more behind this story? Is there something else that we don't know? Is this really one of the greatest hidden aspects of the true identity of the United States? Are these individuals really historical figures from American history, as we're told? Or is there some other identity to them? Or did they look very differently? such as the strange figure that for whatever reason violated the position of honor precedence by being to the right of George Washington? Or is there some hidden president we don't know about who actually came before George Washington? Of course, Stephen speculate on these things while simply draw criticism of conspiracy theory and that you're not supposed to be thinking about these things. You're just supposed to accept it at face value. You will be congratulated for doing that. You will be positively reinforced for doing that as well. And yet, in all these different photographs, we see many strange anomalies that don't seem to reflect exactly what we're told. Indeed, we have an individual that doesn't really look like Thomas Jefferson. I don't know. Is this an individual from some other time? Some other civilization? Is this a poor photograph? Or is it a fake photograph? I honestly don't know. You would think that there would be individuals who actually survived working on this, as 1927, while we're coming up quickly, is going to be 100 years ago, it's 97 years ago now, that could actually verify their work on this sculpture. It's very intriguing to me that it's now very difficult to find any first-hand accounts from any of the architectural or monument constructions that happened from 1927 to 1941 now. Looking at Teddy Roosevelt, and I remember always asking, why was Teddy Roosevelt on Mount Rushmore? And for whatever reason, Teddy Roosevelt has quite a very positive reputation in the United States. Although you could say he was not the most successful Roosevelt president, that was Franklin Roosevelt, who was elected to president four times. In this particular image, we can see the very bright and human-looking eyes of Abraham Lincoln. What an impressive achievement, and certainly not something that we saw in the other sculpture that Borglum had done, which you would think would be much easier, or even the smaller model that he made of Mount Rushmore prior to the entire sculptures being completed, or sculpted out of the side of an entire mountain. Now, does anybody know of any other examples of faces to this level of precision and detail being done or sculpted out of a side of a mountain? And if so, please share them in the comments and let me know if you think there are any that match the beauty and majesty of Mount Rushmore? Or is it simply the fact that Mount Rushmore is simply associated with the identity of the United States and the identity of passing with time? And indeed, it's featured in many movies. It was even supposed to be featured in Star Trek V, where they were going to have another figure to the right of George Washington, although that never got past the actual design or artist rendering. You can see it in the special features of Star Trek V. Although, let's be honest, Star Trek V was eh, not one of the better original series movies. They tried, they tried, okay? But again, looking at these images, you can see, though, that there seems to be a conflict between what is depicted in the pictures, between what Mount Rushmore originally looked like in its six grandfathers configuration, as we'll call this. Is this really what it actually looked like? I don't know. And indeed, Borglum died and had to be succeeded by his son, Lincoln Borglum, to complete the actual sculpture, although he only worked on it for about a month and then he buggered off, apparently having other things to do and then eventually succumbing to death, we're told that he suffered the same lung scarring. Oddly enough, though, you won't find a picture of Lincoln Borglum, but you do see this interesting image when you look up his name and what exactly is going on here to the right of George's face? Is this already Thomas Jefferson or... Is this giving a clue that there's much more going on than meets the eye? Again, these are images. There could be multiple explanations, but it's very strange. Or is it just my imagination? Maybe I'm off base. What do you think? Now, just a few miles from Mount Rushmore, we have the Crazy Horse Memorial. Now, this is really odd because the Native Americans, the Lakota specifically, are not really keen on scarring the landscape by establishing massive structures and monuments like this. And yet we're told that there was a Lakota chief who wanted to have Crazy Horse constructed in a much larger monument than Mount Rushmore. Now, interestingly enough, this project has been going on since the 1940s and is still continuing to this day. Indeed, they've only gotten the face initially carved out of this mountain. What's even more interesting, though, is that this particular project, the Crazy Horse Monument or Memorial, 
and this is what it would potentially look like in its completion, is that it started by the work of one single individual. And indeed, this individual had initially worked on Mount Rushmore with the Borglums, and had actually gotten in a fist fight with Lincoln Borglum because this individual was not keen on being assistant to vice president, as Lincoln Borglum was the vice president. And I'm being a little facetious, but here's the individual, Korzak Ziokowski. Now, we're told that this particular individual is from Poland, although when you look at many of the images of him, he comes across as one of the most stereotypical Americans from the West that you'd expect to see in images. Now, I know everybody's unique and they can adapt their own style, and I'm certainly not castigating this individual for doing so. But yeah, when you look at some other images of him, he's apparently the one who worked on the Crazy Horse Monument all by himself. And apparently, this was going to be a project. He was going to complete this very large sculpture out of the mountain of rock of granite by himself. Now, what's odd about this, in addition to Native Americans supposedly asking for this project, and indeed there are other Native Americans that are quite critical of it as they see that this project is merely a representation of this particular individual, again pictured here and resembling ZZ Top for some reason, that this is merely a passion project of his that has absolutely nothing to do with Native Americans. They just use the Crazy Horse name for that very fact. And indeed, if you look up written accounts of Crazy Horse, the last thing he probably would have wanted was his likeness inscribed or sculpted out of a mountain. And here you can see the individual with his family, and he passed away later in his life in the 1970s, and his wife picked up the project. And indeed, his sons and many members of his family are now continuing the project. We're told that it's all done through private funding. But it's very odd that for several decades, it's all the farther they've gotten. This is Henry Standing Bear. He's the Lakota chief that supposedly wanted this monument to be done. Although, as we know earlier, the Lakota see it as a great affront to the natural landscape to actually scar it by carving figures within the mountains. So it's really strange, and I don't know what to say. Is it just, you know, this particular individual's way of smiting the government that had betrayed the Native Americans and took them through so many trials and tribulations? Or is there more behind this? It's even more bizarre that we're told that this individual worked alone, and yet we have many images of him operating heavy equipment, and who was actually operating the camera. You know, maybe he just hired a photographer to document it? I don't know. A lot of bizarre and conflicting accounts. And indeed, you see here with dynamite going on with this particular mountain, with the Crazy Horse Monument, it's rather strange. And it seems as though there's a slew of strange things that are going on in this portion of South Dakota, especially with these magical rock faces that they just seem to be able to carve up out of rock walls of solid granite. And if you've ever actually been in Custer National Forest, you'll see that there's all kinds of unique qualities to the rock there. And I certainly recommend it as a place to visit, and it's a location I visited many times, and I find many unique aspects to it. And indeed, here you can see that the project continues. But I also ask you to consider that this particular depiction of the face of Crazy Horse, and compare it with the features that you just looked at with the U.S. presidents. Now, I'm just asking you to evaluate the quality of the work. And again, if you know or are aware of any other sculptures that are done in rock faces, I would certainly like to know in the comments and let me know if you think there's anything that compared to Mount Rushmore, or is there anything that compares to Crazy Horse? And how do you compare this depiction of Crazy Horse with the depictions of the U.S. presidents? Now we're told that only one individual did all this, although how direct and obvious is that, or how factual is that, I'm not sure, I don't know. I'm simply relaying what the account says, and you're welcome to research on your own, and if you find something that conflicts with what I'm saying, by all means, let me know in the comments. Here, supposedly, we have some dynamiting that's going on to build the rest of the figure of Crazy Horse. Now, you can actually see this from a great distance, and overall, this seems like it's an impressive sculpture and carving, but what exactly is this? If we go off of the theory that there might be more behind the U.S. presidents in the Six Grandfathers Mountain, is it possible there could be much more behind the presence of this supposed face of Crazy Horse? An individual who we're told would never have accepted allowing their likeness to be carved in a mountain. From people we're told do not accept having mountains scarred or destroyed or desecrated by being carved. And yet you can see that this has been a project that's been going on for many decades with few signs of progress overall. So I'm not exactly sure what to make of this, but once again, there are many conflicting accounts, conflicting images, and it doesn't give us a true, straightforward account, or a chronological account. So what are your thoughts behind all this? 
Now for a bonus, we're going to take a look at Chagrin Falls in Ohio, and this is from Prime Explorer Robert Iaco. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Thank you, Robert, for this share. And the whole point behind this is just to look at some examples of the old world that we see in Chagrin Falls, Ohio, a small village, so we're told, with a population of about four to 5,000, depending on which figures you look at. And the whole point behind this is that you can see elements of the old world in any small town. And here we have the classic columns integrated in the wall, and yes, I know there's an official term for that, but I oftentimes just like to say that because I think it describes what's happening a little bit more better than just using a simple term. And here we see our classic brick house with an older structure behind it, and that unique foundation with the larger foundation stones. So a slew of buildings in a small village in Ohio that give us the presence of the varying scales of the old world construction. Oftentimes you think you need to see a very large Art Deco building or even an old state capitol building, but the reality is these structures are everywhere. And they've been repurposed for every function you can possibly imagine, from administration to restaurants to bars to barber shops to everything beyond your imagination. And it seems to exist in a great reality here in Chagrin Falls, Ohio. Definitely a place I would like to visit. And you can even have hints with some of the infrastructure. I really appreciate photos like this because this just shows you what this infrastructure is standing up to, especially during the difficult winters of the Midwest in the United States. And technically, Ohio is considered the Midwest, at least the eastern portion of it. And here you have this infrastructure that has stood up to this rather extreme weather for many, many years. And yet you also get the impression that it's older than we would initially imagine. And indeed, when you see the falls here with many dams and many handrails next to it, we also have to remember that Ohio is not that far geographically from the Erie Canal. So what's the real story behind it? I'm not really sure. But, Robert, I appreciate these images. Well, thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Welcome to the Restituta Orbis channel, and today we're going to be exploring the Statue of Liberty, one of the most well-known and indomitable symbols of America, its liberty and its democracy. And yes, let us recall that while the United States may be a constitutional republic, what we sell to the rest of the world is democracy. Anakin, my allegiance is to democracy. Well, for all of us, we know that the Statue of Liberty is one of the prime symbols of the United States. And as we're all brought up, wherever we are in the land, we are taught that symbols are very important. They represent things, whether it's a flag, a statue, a monument. Although it should be noted that our society seems to have gone more to emphasizing the flag in recent years, we certainly recall the Statue of Liberty and its paramount importance for representing the United States. And much as we explored Mount Rushmore earlier in this week, we know that the Statue of Liberty is also something as a bit of a time benchmark, if you will. You can always look at that statue, you know what it's been through, and it gives you a reminder that the United States has always been here, and it probably always will be. But what's the true nature behind this statue? What's really the concept behind its construction? Here in this image, we see the base, the pedestal, and the statue, the three components of it. We're going to take a look and consider exactly what this statue is made of, and if you've never visited the Statue of Liberty in person, which I know many people who haven't, and you know many people are aware of it and they're aware of the image of it, but what is it actually made out of? Is this really a statue made out of marble, stone, or is it just simply copper plates or bronze plates? And what about the pedestal? And what about the base? We know what the base is. On this channel we call it a geometrically precise foundation structure. 
But what's the story behind it? How exactly did they erect this impressive statue? And why is it such a symbol today? Also, how widespread across the land is this statue that we say represents the United States of America? Come, let's begin our exploration. Now once more I must ride with my knights to defend what was and the dream of what could be. So throughout all of our lives, wherever you are in the land, everyone associates the Statue of Liberty with the United States. And in fact, in some recognitions, it may even be considered more known than the flag, the red, white, and blue, the 50 stars, and the red and white stripes. But what's the origin of the Statue of Liberty? We'll look at the symbolism, and we're told that the symbolism actually starts from that old religion of Sun Unconquered, or Sol Invictus, from the Roman times, and even a deeper antiquity if we look at the religion of Mithras. Regardless, we're told that was the incipients for the representation of the Statue of Liberty. Now, of course, there are many different angles we can look at with the symbolism, and there's also many conflicting accounts of the symbolism itself, as it seems there is intended to be. Regardless, though, when you look at the Statue of Liberty, you see that it does have that reflection, especially of the beams above the head, the very dignified halo, and the look of the sun. Then there's also the Statue of Freedom, and this is the statue that sits atop of the U.S. Capitol. And in our explorations, we've seen numerous statues that happen to resemble this. Now, why is this called the Statue of Freedom, and what exactly does this represent? Well, it's up for your interpretation. I don't know, it almost looks like a... Captain America from the distant past, in a way. Then we also have the lion, and for some reason they try to tie in the lion to this representation. Now, why is that? We also recall in many of our recent explorations that we've seen the lion in many buildings, on many sculptures, and in many representations, whether it's a courthouse, a state capitol, or just some random building that we're told is built for commercial purposes. We also have the incipients of the representation of the goddess Columbia. Now, I don't want to go too far within looking at the deities because the connection is, well, it depends on what account you're looking at. Sometimes it's a very strong connection, other times it's not a very strong connection. We also have the Native American princess on the right there and cherubs all around them. Then there's also the fact of what's the symbolism of the Statue of Liberty today. And looking at these different symbols in the past, we see how the representation and the perception of it has evolved over time. This actual window here, which certainly doesn't compare to other painted windows that we've seen in churches, and I don't think I'm making a controversial statement by saying that, once hung in the World Building in New York. And you might recall the World Building. We explored it back in our New York exploration. Yes, the building that looked like a Capitol building with a dome and a pediment several floors high. Naturally, we've never really constructed a building like that since, but it was the 1800s, and we could really do whatever we needed to do in the 1800s. Now we consider the Statue of the Republic. This was the mainstay statue of the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, originally scheduled in 1892. And what's intriguing about this is what did this really represent? Well, when we speculate or theorize that the World's Fair has had many more purposes beyond just simply showcasing certain things, it was to put an impression in people. And you might not be surprised to learn that, yes, that great tall statue from the Chicago World's Fair burned down. So what was it really made of? So we have this one-third scale model that we're told is made out of gilded bronze that sits there today. Of course, it doesn't match the glory or grandeur of the original statue, but why do you really need to? And in fact, here's an image, and we see that the fire had hit, and yet the statue is still standing. So perhaps it was a series of fires. You know, There just seemed to be all this carelessness that was going on in the 1800s, and sometimes you had large fires that encompassed great areas of land, and sometimes you had precise fires. It just depended on the day and the time. But whatever the explanation behind these fires, this was a tremendous and incredible statue. And what was the real one actually made of? And I'm talking about the one at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. Was it made out of some sort of gilded copper? Was it made out of bronze? Or was it the paper mache with stucco, as we're told, everything else that you're looking at in this picture was made out of? And therefore was extremely flammable. In fact, did they coat it with kerosene? Who knows? We also have many other depictions, though, of many statues from across the land, whether you're looking at administrative buildings or capital buildings or wherever, and you see rather interesting and conflicting depictions. 
we see figures displaying glory and strength in a different way that we'd expect to see with Roman figures. You also see this in different reliefs, especially if you're doing explorations of old world mansions or houses where you'll see unique figures like this, whether it's on a bed or on a bedpost or a banister where you'll see some sort of figure that has a very lifelike face and very lifelike eyes. And someone was telling me, well, it was just all about scale, and that may be true. Perhaps it's easier to depict more human scale in larger statues or reliefs, and it's more difficult to depict them in smaller ones. But you would think it would be easier to depict them in smaller ones, and indeed you can find that greater human detail when you look at the smaller ones. The tragedy behind the Chicago World's Fair is that the fire didn't leave any buildings or statues for us to actually explore. Imagine if this statue was still standing to this day and we could actually go and examine and analyze it in person. Not using computers, not using machines, because I think the best way to explore something is to rely upon our own senses. But that's just me. Perhaps you think that all those scales and those computers and consulting artificial intelligence is the way to do your explorations. And I don't hold it against you if you do. It's just a different technique. We have other images, though, of statues and reliefs and other columns and different aspects of construction from the Chicago World's Fair. And for example, in this particular statue, or whatever heck it actually was, it almost looks like a cake. What was this depicting and what was this made out of? And does this really look like the cheap stucco? Oddly enough, though, there's something off about these images. So I can't really give you a final conclusion because, again, there's nothing there to actually examine. So all I can go off of is what the images are telling us. And the images give us a conflicting account. They show us these very well-constructed buildings, that incredible, impressive statue of the Republic. But then you compare and contrast that with those statues we just looked at. Indeed, look at the many statues on the structure here behind the Statue of the Republic. What exactly is that showing and what are they made of? Those are the kind of questions that we have to ask as we conduct our explorations because I've come across many people and I don't think they're willfully, willfully ignorant. They just have a belief that the Statue of Liberty in New York is actually made out of some kind of stone. And I suppose if you're looking at it from a distance, it does appear to be made out of a kind of stone and that's what we'd expect. But the reality and the informed reality, because remember those are two different things as well, are completely different. But looking at this statue of the Republic, it shows there was a greater glory in the past. Now under the Statue of Liberty, the three components to it, we have the base, the geometrically precise foundation structure called Fort Wood, built in 1811, made of granite and magic super concrete. We have the pedestal, made of granite stones and magic cement, and we have the statue itself that was made in 1870s, made of copper, gold, steel, and cast iron. So quite a conflict. Most people don't think of the three components, and of course we always have the saying, nothing is impossible in the 1800s. Indeed, the Fort Wood portion of it was made in 1811, at least it was finished, and it was to help fortify the United States from invasion from the British. Interestingly enough, although there were no major battles fought and the fort was never actually used, the only use it had was as a recruiting station. And keep in mind, this is on an island, and it wasn't always called Liberty Island, it was just the fort on it, and then they called it Liberty Island with the fort on it. Well, that seems like a very American thing to do. And we're told that the only military purpose the fort actually served was as a recruiting station during the U.S. Civil War. So let me get this straight. You have all these hundreds or thousands of recruits and you're going to boat them out to an island because that's where the recruiting station is. Hmm. No wonder they had uh, Civil War riots concerning the draft. Where's Daniel Day-Lewis when you need him? In any event, somehow they knew that this fort in 1811 when they built it was going to accommodate both a pedestal and a statue. Now we can look at the estimates of the weight, but just consider this engineering achievement. It should also be noted that our favorite filmmaker, documentarian Ken Burns, made a film about the Statue of Liberty. Well, Ken Burns looking like he's about to undergo the Kolinar ritual there on the right. Hmm, interesting look for him. In any event, I think it's another qualifier for us when we're looking at a true old world structure that if it involves a Ken Burns documentary in addition to it being a popular wedding venue, then it's a bona fide old world structure. Although, I think we have a little bit more of a complicated account with the Statue of Liberty. And here's the actual poster of the great film if you're so inclined to watch it. And, and I will say, Ken Burns does put together very effective documentaries. I'm not going to debate that. We always have a show can farewell, right? And it should be noted that the Statue of Liberty, as its symbol of American prestige, was used in the movie Ghostbusters 2, where they actually used the symbolic power of the Statue of Liberty to motivate the people of New York City to help defeat some neg negatively charged energy, slime, and an evil deity that was trying to return to the world. Indeed, they even generated it with positive slime and walked it down the street. 
Much like with many other structures, there has been numerous renovations that have been done to the Statue of Liberty over the years. There have been components that have been replaced, there's been refacing, there's been infinite cleaning. Bottom line up front, we have a lot of images and a lot of concepts that show us that this particular structure or the statue or this monument, whatever you want to call it, has been renovated. And indeed, in this particular image, we see the implements that we have in our modern civilization, the great sky cranes, the powerful hydraulics, and this is kind of what we'd expect to actually build a structure like this. Although you'd be surprised to know that virtually all the renovation has always been done on the statue itself, which as we talked about was made out of copper plating. Here we have Nancy Reagan when they reopened it. I remember in the 1980s the renovation of the statue was quite a big national story. Although, interestingly enough, when they reopened it, that didn't seem to have as much impact as the constant renovations they were doing on it. So, very intriguing. Also, here you have the National Park Service building, and what's really the nature behind this building on Liberty Island? Now, there's a reason I'm kind of poking a pun at Liberty Island, because they named it Liberty Island before they had any plans to put the Statue of Liberty on the island. They just had a military post there. Well, I guess that seems like a very American thing to do, after all. And here we have other interesting images that seem to show us the copper plating face, and we've heard stories about how the torch has been replaced numerous times. And so suddenly it gives us a completely different perception of what the Statue of Liberty really is. You may think, well, it's actually made of stone of some sort, or maybe some sort of concrete, but the reality is, no, it's supposedly some sort of copper plating. Statue of Liberty was also featured in the film Escape from New York. And indeed, this was a very powerful film, and we can see the difference in scale and imagination of the head of the Statue of Liberty. Indeed, it was also featured in that, um, well, we'll just say, lots of motion camera sickness film, Cloverfield, where the monster tossed the head. Ah, there you go, Donald Pleasance as president. He portrayed the president in Escape from New York. Just imagine if you had a president like Donald Pleasance. <laughs> Yes, and you might recall that Donald Pleasance has been featured in many other films, and he was definitely a wonderful actor. He was also known as being the quintessential James Bond, mo James Bond movie villain. So make of that what you will. And in the film Escape from New York, Liberty Island Security Control, United States Police Force Liberty. I always found the juxtaposition and the conflict within that quite comical. Also considering the fact that it was originally called Bedlow Island, apparently, and it may have even had other names behind it. And that's why I always find it interesting that people get uh, very attached to names, because names can simply be changed at any point in time. For example, I come across many army veterans, and when I mention the name Fort Moore, they have no idea what I'm talking about. And if you're a veteran, do you know where Fort Moore is? Or do you know what state it's in? Now, if I mention another name, the older name, everyone would probably know. But the point I'm getting at is the names actually change. We also have the nearby Ellis Island, and there's an interesting comparison between Ellis and the now-named Liberty Island. We also have these very interesting structures, and Ellis Island was known as the entry point for the United States, where everyone immigrating from Europe, and we're going to be looking at that carefully in a population exploration coming soon, came into the United States. We have many construction images, though, of the Statue of Liberty, and the story behind the Statue of Liberty is there were a couple of French individuals who wanted to provide a gift for the United States, and at the end of the Civil War, they were also abolitionists, so they didn't believe in slavery, and so, according to the official account, since the United States had finally done away with slavery after the Civil War, this was going to be their gift, and they constructed the statue and components in France initially, and featured different components in different places, such as the torch being featured in the Centennial exhibition in Philadelphia in 1876 because, you know, that's how you generate funding for a statue. You build it first, show off pieces, transport it, such as the head being featured here in the Paris World's Fair in 1878. Doesn't this just make total sense? Now, yes, considering the fact that this is just simply a copper-plated statue or an iron-plated statue, or even if it was made out of the cheap paper mache and stucco, that is, it would be the lightest objects you can imagine, how challenging would it be to transport these components across the Atlantic? We also have conflicting accounts that this is actually a construction photo from when they're assembling the statue itself. Now, this doesn't prove anything, it could simply just be an error in the account. But yes, there are errors in the official account, and that's not to suggest that there's any sort of intentional effort behind that, it's just that people make mistakes, we know that to be true. 
Looking at the Statue of Liberty, though, and we consider the mission of these French individuals and their efforts to get the statue built and convincing President Grant to appropriate the funding, and really what happened was France built the statue, the United States built the pedestal, and they already had the fort there, the fort that the United States had built in 1811 that just happened to be ready to fit it. And here's the individual who made it happen, Charles Pomeroy Stone, genius engineer but a dodgy battlefield commander. Now, why do we mention Charles Pomeroy Stone? We have a statue made in France, a pedestal made in the United States, and an old military fortification made in the start of the 1800s that were going to fit together perfectly to display the statue that still stands to this day. Now, Charles Pomeroy Stone's an interesting individual, one of the brilliant engineers of West Point repute and an early American Civil War general. Although we said he's a dodgy battlefield commander, and I know that's a... <laughs> Australian colloquial expression for something that just doesn't go so well. I've also, heard, I've also heard people from New Zealand use it. So, in the Battle of Ball's Bluff, which followed the Union North disaster in the Battle of Bull Run, General Pomeroy Stone, Charles Pomeroy Stone, was in command, and he had a U.S. Senator, Mr. Baker, who showed up and took command of forces, and they were supposed to conduct a reconnaissance in force. Well, long story short, they allowed their force to be isolated. General Stone didn't really seem to exercise effective command and control on the battlefield or really have any idea what's going on. And because of this, he faced a lot of criticism. This battle was a disaster for Union forces, as they had over a thousand casualties and were defeated by a vastly inferior Confederate force. And the United States Army continues its tradition of struggling in battles in the vicinity of Washington, D.C. We have Senator Edward Baker being killed in action during that battle. So, even though he was a colonel at time and General Stone technically outranked him, Baker was the one who took charge on the field. Can you imagine that, a senator actually getting on a battlefield today and leading a battle and then being killed? Yeah, it's kind of difficult to imagine. Well, look, General Stone was not responsible for the Battle of Ball's Bluff, and he wasn't responsible for returning, for returning fugitive slaves to their owners because he was just following the law. And even though you would think he should be condemned for this, he was not. So, again, it's that conflicting account you get from the United States Civil War. Slavery was terribly wrong, but here you have Stone Pasha. He went through a lot of difficulties, and he became Chuck of Egypt, as he was known. Now, why are we focusing on... Charles Pomeroy Stone. Because this is an individual who, much like George B. McClellan, who was actually his benefactor, and we've come across him before, they were fooled by the simple Quaker gun deception in the United States Civil War. But looking at General Charles Pomeroy Stone, we do have a conflicting account of an individual. We're told he was an effective general, a genius engineer. He wasn't a very good battlefield commander. Well, perhaps it's because this guy was his mentor. And we've come across him before, General George B. McClellan. He's also a personal figure who is a little bit of a hero of Ken Burns, although Ken Burns won't admit that he's a hero. He'll just say that he laments the fact that he has to cast him in a bad light. I find it quite interesting. In any event, when we look at General Charles Pomeroy Stone, who served in the Union Army, and then he faced court-martial, although he was never actually court-martialed, he was just imprisoned, and then he was just sort of let go. It's a really strange account. But we come always back to these same individuals, these individuals of importance and paramounts during the United States Civil War, and again, it creates more questions. Here we have General McClellan with President Abraham Lincoln. This is a very intriguing image, though. I'm seeing some really odd things and questioning this. And it seems, hey, wait a minute, what the heck's happening? Is President Lincoln missing a leg here? Did he face amputation? What's going on? Wait a minute, why does this guy seem to have three legs? Am I just seeing things? And then we have a ghost figure. I know, it's just, it's limitations in the photography, but really, why, why is President Lincoln missing a leg? I'm not sure. What do you think's going on here? Let me know in the comments. Okay, back on topic, Statue of Liberty. So, Charles Pomeroy Stone faced some crucibles. He didn't serve in the Civil War after that terrifying battle was lost and a senator was killed, which he was not responsible for. And like I said, he was not responsible for returning fugitive slaves to their owners because, in the official account, he was just enforcing the law. It was the law. Does anybody else get a pass for that? No. But he built the Statue of Liberty. He was the one who made it happen. And indeed, in this little artistic depiction, we have the cornerstone being laid. I mean, why take a picture when you can actually have an artist there and sketch it, right? Doesn't that make a lot more sense? But don't worry. I know you might be asking questions about this, and you might think this is poking holes in the narrative. Well, it doesn't. Because you can see this cornerstone today. And you can see, it's right there. It says when they laid it in 1884. It also happens to say that it was dedicated in the American Museum of Immigration in 18, or 1962. So when exactly did that, they inscribe all that on the cornerstone? Well, it looks like the inscription was all done in 1962. I may be making an assumption there, but it all looks like it was done at the same time. 
You also have other interesting images of Liberty Island itself that shows the infrastructure being torn up a little bit. And the other thing I haven't commented on is just how much the pedestal that was constructed well after the fort, many decades, over half a century later, looks exactly like it. I guess they had the same magical main cement and then the same magical granite stones that they made both structures out of. And again, think of what an engineering achievement it must have been that they actually had the ability of precognition, in other words, to see the future in 1811, that they knew that they had to make Fort Wood, which is what the original baseline structure is made. It's made for an American veteran who supposedly died in a defensive battle in the Battle of uh, Lake Erie in the War of 1812, one of the few battles the United States military did manage to win because, you know, looking at the military history of the War of 1812, it didn't go well for the United States. But looking at Liberty Island and then looking at Ellis Island here, you can see the look of an almost artificial coastline. I don't know, it's very strange. Well, we go back to the story of the Statue of Liberty, so the French individuals whose names really aren't that important right now because you might say, well, don't they matter to the historical account? It's interesting, though, that they wanted to give a gift to the United States, and that's how it all happened. President Grant went along with it, and the next thing you knew, it had support, and they actually funded it through donations. So, really, the people who made it happen were the many nameless Americans who contributed less than a dollar apiece, or $33 if we go with inflation now, and that's how they managed to build the Statue of Liberty. We're informed that they built the pedestal on top of Fort Wood, and then the French individuals that assembled the statue, well, they didn't assemble a statue, they built it in pieces and then transported it to the United States, and then they assembled it in the United States. And all this was under the supervision of Charles Pomeroy Stone. So, while he may have been a dodgy battlefield commander with some issues, he was a brilliant engineer. Think about this. He was able to put together architectural projects along with artistic sculpting projects from multiple different sources, fit them all together, and make it happen. Now, you're looking at this image, and you can see that this is more of the renovation, but I just show this to indicate how easily the official account could be confused, because on the right, we can get an idea of when that photo was from, and it's certainly not from prior to 1970, now was it? Yet we look at these construction images, and we can see the components of the Statue of Liberty, and oddly enough, here we have individuals just parked up on the torch as though they're having a grand old time. And we have scaffolding, and it, you think about the challenges of transporting this in components. But of course, you can say, well, they transported obelisks across the sea, so that shouldn't have been an issue. Strangely enough, there's a curious lack of construction of the pedestal, though, which we're told that the United States had to raise the money for so they could actually put the statue that the French had made as a gift for the United States on top of. Very odd and strange. And again, we've talked about how the pedestal looks the same as a fort, but then you look at some of these other images, and this is supposedly an official construction image of the pedestal, but it's really, really hard to find images that actually show the pedestal and the fort that it's built on top of together. Now, perhaps it was just a limitation in the photography, or we could just say it wasn't very well documented, but again, it's another one of those aspects that seems to stand out. And we have no shortage of images, though, that seem to show the components of the Statue of Liberty being constructed, for some reason, and then assembled. Now, what exactly are these images really showing us? Well, in many of them, you just see what appears to be a workshop, the large components already assembled, and the components actually in the background. Indeed, what are they actually assembling here in this particular image? I mean, this is stated to be an official construction photo of the components of the Statue of Liberty, but is it, or are we just looking at something else? These are the kind of questions we have to ask when we do this image analysis. Now, I'm not, again, implying that anybody is trying to contrive anything. I'm merely stating that mistakes are made. Ah, I was wondering when we were going to see the individuals with the top hats. Hey, Frank, how you doing today? Yeah, there's a lot of rubble and junk in here, but I'll you know, just hang out and supervise that. How's your top hat fitting? Yeah, mine feels a little tight, too. Maybe we should go to bowler hats. Those might be a little more comfortable. But you have these images that just cause you to question exactly what's going on, because indeed, while these are listed as official construction images of the components of the Statue of Liberty, is this in France, is this in the United States, you have a very mixed and conflicted account, because you can say, well, we know, we saw in the images that they had the components displayed and photographed in France, and some transported the United States, whether it was the torch or the head. You do have, compo you do have images like this that give you the idea that they're building something, 
And yes, this could be part of the Statue of Liberty. But then you also have variants in terms of the quality. Now, is it in the quality of the image or is it in the quality of what's being constructed? Or is this another one of Borglum's little scale models that they were building before they could build the full Statue of Liberty? Not sure. You also have the really odd images of the assembly of the statue itself. Almost looking as though they assembled it in New York City itself, and then once it was fully assembled, somehow they towed it over there to Liberty Island and then put it up on the pedestal that they rapidly built just for the purpose of displaying the Statue of Liberty. It's really strange. And indeed, some of these official images that you look at don't seem to match what we know about for photography capabilities at the time. But I don't know, maybe I'm just speaking with too much speculation. But it's just really strange. It doesn't make any sense. And indeed... You actually try to look at the account, I'll also lament the same thing that I lamented with the Mount Rushmore construction photos earlier this week. Why were these photos not well documented in chronological order? Why can we not see just a simple photo book that could easily be scanned and uploaded that show us dates and logical progression of the statue? Why is this such a conflict and mixed account? And the explanation will be because there were issues. It was the 1800s. Remember, we have an account of a judge in Iowa in a courthouse who kept records in a shoebox. So they just weren't very good at record keeping in the 1800s. Okay, fine. But if they weren't very good at record keeping, how could they possibly be this brilliant to have a fort that was built in the 1800s, the early 1800s, a pedestal that was built in the 1880s, a statue that was built in the 1870s in components, then shipped over components, reconstructed, reassembled on a pedestal, on a fort, and it all worked out perfectly because you had a genius American engineer who wasn't the best of Civil War battlefield commanders, but you know, he's hardly alone in that fact, and it just all worked out perfectly. And the statue is still standing there to this day. And in fact, the pedestal and the fort have been so well constructed, they've never had to do any renovations to it. In fact, the only renovations you'll see that were being done were to the statue itself. And you'll say, well, of course, because it's made out of copper plating. So it's just a series of odd accounts. And I'm not even going to go into the various numbers about the Statue of Liberty where you see 7 and 11 and other things that come up a lot because I'm often under the impression that numbers seem to serve to distract us. But I'm not discounting it entirely. I'm just not really exploring it too much in this exploration because I have other explorations I'm saving number considerations for. There are many replicas of the Statue of Liberty across the United States, and this probably wouldn't be too surprising because this is a symbol of the United States, and it represents the United States. So you'd expect to see all these different replicas by courthouses, state capitals, and indeed there's no shortage of them. Yet, oddly enough, you see different aspects to the statues that are depicted. So, for example, this one in front of this courthouse, and it looks like we've got one of these lovely brutalist courthouses. I wonder if this is on the same grounds that an older courthouse was. I didn't look up the particular account for this location. But the statue and the pedestal seem somewhat genuine. And, of course, we have a plaque on it. So what is really going on? Which of the statues are genuine and which of the ones seem to be more modern reconstructions? Well, you can find many older images across the land in the United States, and we're just looking at the replicas in the United States itself, that seem to indicate that there was a little bit more of a quality of construction put into these statues. And there's even accounts that some are actually made out of stone and some are actually carved, and you know maybe you got Borglum involved as well. Look at, the con look at the contrast, though, in this particular image with the courthouse that this one's by, and tell me what you see here. You see this aspect a lot when you consider the differences in construction and the quality that was put in the effort in it, and you can just see it in the image, and of course, if you could go visit it and you're allowed to touch it, you can interface with it and get a better idea. You even have some statues or replicas of the Statue of Liberty that are found within the courthouses itself because smaller versions of are made. And again, this would make sense within the mainstream account because the Statue of Liberty represents the United States and, like we said, every state capital, courthouse, city hall, administrative and municipal building across the United States would want to depict the Statue of Liberty. What I find interesting, though, is there seems to be quite a variance. In other words, there's different models and different depictions of the Statues of Liberty or what we're told are affiliated as the Statue of Liberty. And then, of course, there's many different benefactors who will suddenly provide these statues. Also, oddly enough, you have some that seem to be on pre-existing obelisks or columns or some other object that's already there, and they just decided to park a statue on top of. I mean, I guess it makes kind of sense, and it also rhymes with the account of the main Statue of Liberty that we have in Liberty Island in New York City. 
So very intriguing. Look at the brickwork on the building behind this one. And perhaps this is a little bit more of a legitimate one, although it seems to match in another either copper plating or bronze plating for all we know. And believe it or not, that seems to be the way many statues are made across the land, and that seems to reflect the capability that we could believe is in our current era of civilization. With the faith and courage, the Boy Scouts of America. And you'll find the Boy Scouts of America are supposedly responsible for dedicating many copies of the Statue of Liberty in many of the courthouses. And you'll find no shortage of plaques that'll tell you exactly what you're supposed to think and what you're supposed to know behind them. So what to make of all this? It's hard to say. It seems to be quite a conflicted account. It seems to be as though we're given the notion that, yes, this is the symbol of the United States. Don't ask any more questions behind it. It was a gift from the French, and they even said it in Ghostbusters 2. Remember, the Statue of Liberty, she's French. Yes, of course. Isn't that a lovely courthouse building that we have there? It might have been one that we've explored before. But that's where you'll see all these in front of, and yet Liberty looks a little different in that depiction as well. Yes, of course, there's even one at the Iowa State Capitol, and it was dedicated by the Boy Scouts of America, because why wouldn't we have a Statue of Liberty at the Iowa State Capitol? But then I always wondered, then the Soldiers and Sailors column, which they built in the late 1890s, why didn't they put a Statue of Liberty on top of that? Oh, no, 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 no. We have a different statue of victory we're going to put on the column, not the Statue of Liberty. You also have replicas of the Statue of Liberty that are across the land, not just in the United States. And I was rather intrigued to realize just how prevalent this statue is across the land. You'll find examples in Spain and Brazil, and we'll look at some specific locations that might be surprising to us as well. But I was rather shocked to realize that, yes, in Brazil, apparently, the Statue of Liberty is quite a mainstay there. And it looks to be the same depiction. And look at that. They even have a nice replica of the pedestal, too. Boy, they went all out there. Just need the star fort. Yes, of course, there'd be one in Ukraine. This is an interesting look at a more relaxed Lady Liberty there with some glorious onlookers there that are relaxing with her and they're all having a grand time. But everywhere you look, you see replicas of the Statue of Liberty. And I had no idea just how far and across the land the Statue of Liberty really was. Now, oftentimes in the official account, we're told that many other nations have resented the United States over the years. Or is it just as Alistair Cook said, they simply want to replicate the United States materialism, such as China? Yes, even in China, they have a copy of a Statue of Liberty, which is supposedly above a tomb here. I don't know what to make of that. And then you think about all the other locations that you have it in where you wouldn't expect to see a Statue of Liberty. I like this uh, two-handed pose here, like she's guiding an airplane. Here we have one in Israel. Certainly didn't expect to see a Statue of Liberty in Israel. Or how about Japan, Land of the Rising Sun? Yes, we're going to build a Statue of Liberty here. Maybe MacArthur directed it, I don't know. And in Denmark, they got one made out of Lego. Well, you got to give them credit there in Denmark. You know, of course, it'd be made out of Lego there. Actually, I think that's a pretty cool concept. <laughs> It'll probably last longer, too. And wherever you have the replicas, whether it's back in Vegas or across the land, and here you have this one made by Salvador Dali, famous artist who very nearly played the emperor. In the Dune movie by Alejandro Jodorowsky, we've got one in the United Kingdom, and they're just so widespread. So what exactly is really the story behind it? It seems to be a very reinforced notion that we are supposed to embrace this symbol of liberty. Indeed, it's in the title. We're enlightening liberty across the land. And that's what the Statue of Liberty is. It's a powerful symbol. But does it have a different purpose? And what's really the story behind the pedestal and the star fort formation? Well, let's take a look at our five eras theory, and I'm going to give you what I think the Statue of Liberty may be. I believe that what we have here is a structure that does actually have different components that shows different eras. Indeed, the Star Fort, or Fort Wood, being from the Third Era, which is what we speculate is when the Star Fort builders were. And that actually matches with the official chronology that we're given of the construction of the base. But that's why that base is so well constructed and why it stood up all this time, and why you could add different aspects to it. The pedestal likely being from the fourth era, or the civilization that directly preceded ours, that we refer to as Tartaria, simply as a reference term on this channel. And then very likely the statue itself was indeed constructed perhaps in the early fifth era, or maybe in a transition period between the fourth and the fifth era. But that's just a theory. What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments. Concerning. 
Well, thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. I'd love to stay, but... Welcome to the Rest Tutor Orbis channel, and I thought we'd come back and take a closer look at the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal, the infrastructure and engineering achievement, a required waterway from Lake Erie to the Atlantic. What came first though? Was it really the canal or the towns? History tells us the towns came first, and I suppose that makes sense that they had the cities of Buffalo, although it was a village at the time, and they needed to construct a canal to connect Lake Erie to Atlantic. The solution was to build a 363 mile canal and build 36 locks and other supporting infrastructure to include aqueducts and diverting waterways, and as we know in the 1800s, this was not exactly a great difficulty. But it was a dream project that had been suggested in the 1700s according to the official history. And once the United States was a nascent nation, they even submitted the proposal to President Thomas Jefferson in the very start of the 1800s. Thomas Jefferson was not exactly a supporter of the project. He said, you know, I'm something of an engineer myself, and I might be wanting a bagel with my coffee. And he said that the project of the Erie Canal was just outright lunacy, or just short of lunacy. In any event, he was not going to support it. So it was left to subsequent politicians, namely this individual, DeWitt Clinton, governor of New York, who bears more than a striking resemblance to actor Cliff DeYoung. I'm sure that's just another coincidence, as we have many in these explorations. And he became the real champion of the project of building a canal in New York at that time. And remember, the United States was a nascent nation, and this was just after the War of 1812. Well, he contracted this engineer, Benjamin Wright, civil engineer who bears a bit of a resemblance to a Telosian in capabilities. I mean, he had to, to be able to build this canal, that is, having telekinesis. And we also have other amateur engineers who assisted with the project, such as this individual, Canvas White. Also, we're told he's the inventor of the wondrous Rossendale cement. And they managed to complete the canal in eight short years, and it was all done by amateurs. Yes, all of these engineers and individuals who were responsible for building this canal and all the engineering ingenuity that went along with it, they were not professional engineers. In fact, most of them practiced law. And I suppose that's the real explanation that we have from the 1800s is this is the United States, and it's the 1800s. You do not need professional experts. You have people on the ground who could suddenly become experts. Benjamin Wright, Canvas White, yes, those names rhyme, isn't that funny? They were the ones who could simply innovate all of these wondrous technological aspects to complete this canal. And keep in mind, when you build a canal, you're not just simply constructing a canal, you actually have to excavate it and dig it. And keep in mind that since the United States was not developed at this time, they also had to remove all the trees. Oh, and by the way, they had to cut this canal out of limestone and rock and they managed to achieve this in eight years. Now we have supporters of the mainstream narrative who like to tell us that the Industrial Revolution had happened and that made this possible. Yes, the Industrial Revolution, although heavy machinery was not invented until 1890 and employed in engineering projects on a large scale until the early 1900s, and we saw the wondrous engineering projects that gave us, but the Erie Canal is impressive because they did this all with human and animal power and to a lesser extent hydraulic power. So they cut through the rock, they managed to cut a nice deep canal, they managed to build it 363 miles in eight years. Oh, and by the way, they also managed to invent new methods of removing all the tree stumps when they pulled all the trees down in the forest so they could dig out this canal. And that was all done with animal power. And again, remember, and here's one of the images that you can see, this was done before the advent of heavy machinery. And, you know, we have this nice sketched picture, this rendering, this drawing, and that's all we really need to answer all of our questions. I mean, if somebody could draw something, it must have happened, right? And you can see how convincing this is. 
Now, we also have another account that the canal was namely built by German stonemasons and Irish immigrants who came in and did a lot of the heavy labor. But we're also told that some of those wicked nativists that they had in the United States, even as early as the 1820s, attacked many of the workers. They also fell sick with fever and other issues. Yet, despite all these issues being attacked viciously and physically and suffering from numerous sicknesses and ailments, they still managed to complete the canal in a very short amount of time. And it's certain to say that even with our wondrous technological capability today, could we build a canal like this in eight years? Well, maybe we could. The answer always is now is we just need the money, but we have the distraction of safety standards and other technological distractions. We do have images that show us how they poured the water, the marriage of the waters as they called it once the canal was complete to show the fresh water and the salt water being mixed and they now had their wonderful water highway the other intriguing aspect is all the other different things that grew up on the erie canal once they suddenly had it i mean i don't mean to suggest that the erie canal was already there but it's intriguing when you look at the development of the cities that are along the Erie Canal, such as Rochester, Syracuse, and others, and the fact that we already explored Buffalo earlier, as Buffalo is the terminus point of the Erie Canal. And we did take an initial look at it at that time. We also have impressive architecture and infrastructure that was established within the Erie Canal, such as these wondrous aqueducts. And we're told that they had to come up with a solution for the trouble of cement that was available at the time, setting in the water, as technologically they didn't have one. And this led to the great invention of the Rossendale cement, supposedly by an individual named Canvas White, who we looked at earlier, the amateur engineer who was really an assorted hanger-on and suddenly became a major supporter of the project. But you can see that a lot of this infrastructure still stands to this day, and it's very impressive. And none of this natural cement appears to be eroding, much like the current Portland cement that we prefer using in all of our architectural and engineering projects in the modern and advanced 21st century. But for various reasons, we're told that they stopped using the natural cement. So I guess Portland cement's just that much better. You can also see that there's no shortage of bridges over the Erie Canal, and we have many different songs and American cultural references to the use of the Erie Canal. The whole purpose behind the Erie Canal is it's what led to the rapid advancement and development of these communities. Of course, we also had a rapid advancement and development of many Midwestern communities that were far to the west of the Erie Canal, essentially the states of Illinois, Minnesota, Iowa, and all the others that grew up very rapidly, and they didn't have a canal. Of course, the answer will be, but they had the Mississippi River. Okay, fine, so be it. But we can look at these lock systems and see that these were developed and built at a time by people who were amateur engineers. So really, that's all they needed at the start of the 1800s? You just need a bunch of amateur engineers and a very dedicated politician, and suddenly you can build a canal out of nothing. You can bring in a bunch of immigrant workers who speak varied languages and put them to work on the task, and they can do an expert job at it. Oh, and they can die from sicknesses and then be attacked by people who employ nativist standards. Now, we're not told that the no name or no nothing party, whatever you want to call it, at the time existed in the 1820s when they were building this very elaborate and difficult canal. And yet at the same time, they're telling us that the same sentiment existed. So once again, it's quite intriguing how we have this existence of political parties in the United States. But whatever the actual explanation, we're told that they managed to build the canal in eight years using all human animal labor and a little bit of hydraulic power. The other interesting things to consider is they just seem to be able to innovate technological solutions on the fly. And I always find it intriguing that whenever we have these difficult challenges when considering our official historical account, the answer tends to be is that we have polymaths who just seem to pop up. I mean, that's how they explain the entire renaissance is suddenly all these polymaths just came about. These people who were experts in everything and they could do anything because they would apply themselves properly. I wasn't really joking earlier when I said that President Jefferson was something of an engineer himself. I mean, it seems that if you practice law at this time, you could really do anything. And we do have some very intriguing schematics and sketches of both the locks and the Erie Canal itself. Although, when you consider this, is this really something that was a design from the ground up? Or was this something that was merely a recording of what was already there? And then the real project was simply augmenting it and then pressing it back into service. What makes more sense given the timeline that we have? And what makes more sense given the respective skill set of the individuals that we have involved with this supposed project? 
Now, if you want to sit there and believe that a group of legal eagles from the early 1800s and politicians and then a slew of people who had these varied skills of being polymaths were just able to innovate and pull this canal out of their unique imagination when one had not existed before, then you're welcome to go ahead and believe that. But you have to consider the logistical challenges of doing all this. And let's just be kind and generous. Let's say that the official historical account is correct. How exactly did they logistically support this large grouping of individuals and animals that they had working in this area? I mean, they certainly had to develop the ability to bring supplies to them. They didn't have the railroad at the time. And indeed, the official historical account tells us that it was actually the development of the railroad that began to supplant the Erie Canal as the main highway from the Great Lakes to the Atlantic. We do have many of these images, though, that give us the impression that they used the canal for many transport purposes. And of course, we're told ad nauseum to this day that it's far cheaper to transport things over a waterway than even on rails, depending on the particular situation. But for whatever reason, the canal fell out of favor, but it's still managed and used by the good people of New York. Now, let's look at the other projects that we've examined. We've looked at a very unique and incredible dam built in Art Deco style in the middle of the desert in the southwestern United States. We looked at an impressive national monument, Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. And now we look at how isolated this particular canal was. And really think about all the engineering effort that went into this canal. They had to dig it. They had to go through varied terrain in New York State at the time, which would eventually be called the Empire State because of how connected it was. You know, it's very interesting for a nation that loves and cherishes democracy, and we certainly love to say that every day in the United States, we sure also love to bandy about the term empire. Empire this, empire that. I wonder why that is. In any event, given how well connected New York was, we're told that the Erie Canal is how the state grew up so quickly and why they had such large communities at the time. Although the Erie Canal would have nothing to do with the growth of New York City because that was right off the Atlantic, there's no shortage of commemoration projects that tell us just how important it was. And something else that's really intriguing is when you look at all the cities or towns or villages that are along the Erie Canal to this day, chart their development and how they came about and take a look at their population counts you might find something very interesting about certain towns and cities that might not exactly make a lot of sense if we're supposed to go off the historical account i'm not here to tell you everything i'm just here to point you in certain directions and allow you to do your own research and see if you can corroborate this account and maybe it did happen exactly like this i mean we're told that benjamin wright tried to design other canals as well even though he was not officially a professional engineer, I guess he really got the knack of it, though, once he had completed the Erie Canal. I mean, just think about it. If you could pull off a project like that, why would you want to waste time being a lawyer? You may as well switch to being a civil engineer and design and build more canals across the country. The other interesting aspect, though, is considering the nature of the United States in the early 1800s. The United States did not have a grand old time in the War of 1812. It was quite a struggle, and yet it's a conflict that's nearly as strange as the United States Civil War in terms of its account and great difficulties. We're told that the United States was unable to achieve many military successes in the War of 1812. And the reason I reference that is, at the same time, if they were thinking about innovating and building a canal where none had existed before, then why didn't they just simply clear the terrain? I mean, level the entire terrain. If they had hills that they couldn't get over, it would be a lot easier just to dig it out. We'll look at some of the cities on the Erie Canal, such as Rochester, New York, and we also think back to our examples of Rochester, Minnesota. I'm wondering if they have a plumber building equivalent here, and believe it or not, they actually do. It's very interesting, though, when we consider how many of these names tend to get recycled and reused across the United States, such as Rochester. And there are many older buildings in Rochester, in New York, that give us the impression that this community is much older than we might like to believe. Certainly there's no shortage of old world architecture and you'll find some of the finest examples in all the cities and towns that are along the Erie Canal to this day. And indeed when we explore Buffalo, New York, it's one of the most well known examples. Rochester has its own very unique building that's quite similar to the Plummer building that we looked at in Minnesota. And this is the New York Times Square building. And these are the wings of progress on the top of it. Now, naturally this is an Art Deco building because what else would it be? And we're told that this particular Art Deco building had its cornerstone laid on the very day that the stock market crash in 1929 happened. 
Now you might be thinking, well, shouldn't the building have been canceled? But of course not. There was no issue with completing this building by 1930, and it has a very unique design with it, with the wings of progress on top of it. This is definitely a building that I've tabbed for an on-site exploration because I'd certainly like to see what on the interior survives. The initial look that I've gotten from some of the images shows that this is an Art Deco building that unfortunately has not fared well. But when you see some of the other surrounding buildings here in Rochester, New York, you can see that there's still the signs of old world architecture and a very different signature than we'd expect in a more modern American city in the middle of New York or Main Street, USA. Something about this doesn't look Main Street, USA at all. The other interesting thing is we've looked at very unique Art Deco buildings that do seem to be associated with the Erie Canal and the Great Lakes region, especially Lake Erie. You might recall the Mohawk building that we looked at earlier with its uh, very, very impressive <laughs> action figure on the front of it that somebody decided to do at that time. Why is it we always have these Art Deco buildings, though, that always seem to have the same construction timeline? They're always done within a year or less. The longest ones are two years, but the average is one year. And they always seem to be constructed in the late 20s. Many of them were even told they started construction, such as this one in Rochester with the Great Depression happening. And so is it really that old adage that all you need is an economic downturn and suddenly you can churn out the greatest buildings? Well, I guess since we're told that the economy is doing so well in the United States right now, we're not going to get any really nice and new buildings. Sorry, it's container revival style for you, and that's going to be the nicest house you can get. Looking a little closer, though, we do see some of the very intricate details that we've come to associate with Art Deco. Now think back to this whole account that we have of the Erie Canal if this canal was already there and these settlements were already there, which we have strong indications that that tends to be the case, then what does it really tell us about the previous civilization? That the Erie Canal really was one of its highways and that they had a very different layout in terms of our civilization. Now, does that mean that they didn't have roads or does it mean that they had something more advanced that they just happened to use the waterways with? Or perhaps the waterways were just simply an aesthetic for them and they had other means of transporting things. Going to Syracuse, New York, we see no shortage of old world buildings off of the Erie Canal, and we can see some varied and beautiful designs along with it. Very interesting aspects though when we look at some of the towers and the clock towers and all the very well-developed architecture, and you'll find some very beautiful sites in Syracuse. And in other tangential explorations, we've looked at Syracuse in a variety of ways before. We've even looked initially at Syracuse University. Quite intriguing, though, that so many old world buildings managed to survive in one particular location. Now, if you're thinking about this and whatever our actual account was when Syracuse was discovered, because we're told that Syracuse grew up rather quickly, and a lot of it was based on the university, and of course it was based on the traffic of individuals coming through on the Erie Canal. That is something that does actually support the mainstream account, and I will say it when we do come across it. But I find it so intriguing that we have all these buildings that just seem to repeat all across the United States from the old world, such as our quote-unquote flat iron building. I mean, you may as well have one of those here in Syracuse as well, but we've seen this type of building all over the place. So very intriguing. In fact, they even have one in China, but we're told it's because China likes to copy U.S. architecture. And then let's not forget Archibald Stadium at Syracuse University. Yes, our stadium that we looked at during our stadium's exploration that looked a bit like a castle. And of course, we posited many different possibilities for what stadiums originally were. And you can see no shortage of old world buildings around this particular stadium. Although it should be noted that uh, Syracuse University is not free from the scourge of brutalist architecture as we see here in what I'm told is a library. I'll be honest, I haven't actually been to Syracuse University and don't really have a strong inclination to be going back to universities for any on-site explorations anytime soon. I'll look at them, but for some reason I seem to have difficulties. But here we have a nice Carnegie Library. Yes, that's exactly what they'll tell us. And you can see looking at the building that this is indeed a Carnegie Library. And you have all the nice trappings of a typical Carnegie Library. The wonderful columns and the great towers because how's he going to know you're going into such a building? Some of the other architecture though that you look at across Syracuse is very intriguing such as these buildings and 
than what they have this monument or exactly what you want to call this and I intentionally didn't do the research on the monument because I just wanted to get my own impressions of it and I think this is something and on a more serious note I'm gonna get on the ground and look at all these cities on the Erie Canal because I'd very much like to assess the construction materials especially with this account that we have of extensive uses of what we're told by the historical account is Rossendale cement you know before we decided to use the better and more creaky Portland cement or concrete or whatever you want to call it in subsequent years very interesting across the board though and I like to assess exactly what the construction materials of these buildings of the supporting infrastructure of the canal is and every monument and even this church over here and compare and contrast it with some of the other buildings that we have that's always the nice thing when you have uh, so many different old world buildings in one location is it allows you to do a little bit better of analysis or you could be one of those people who supports the mainstream account and believe that you simply need technology to actually tell you what these buildings are constructed of. You don't need to make your own assessments, just have someone else or something else do the thinking for you. And really, you really don't have any reason to do anything. You can just sit there and accept everything as it's told to you. And if that's how you want to be, have at it. I, however, find it a little bit more intriguing to do these explorations and really consider exactly what we've been told because there seems to be quite a significant mystery here with the Erie Canal. Not just with the canal itself, but also with all these cities and towns that have grown up along it, all this supporting infrastructure. It seems to me that we have a very strong example of numerous lines of evidence for wondrous constructions, whether it's part of Syracuse University, it's part of Rochester, New York, the other towns, the canal infrastructure, that give us clear indications of a previous civilization that was far more advanced and had far greater capabilities of construction than we have to this day. Now you can repeat and say that yes, if we were so inclined we could do these buildings if we wanted to, but we have safety standards, we have distractions, and it just doesn't make sense. We need to build things that are more efficient now. And if you want to keep saying that, and if you want to keep thinking that, be my guest. But you're doing that when you have all this evidence that's right in front of you everywhere that you look. And of course when you show these images to someone and you say, this is strange, they'll say, What's strange about this? And they'll be completely serious about it. And perhaps you just have to accept the fact that some people are very, very strongly indoctrinated with what they've been told. And as we know, what you've been told first tends to be the truth, no matter how much conflicting evidence that you tend to see. And that's one of the more difficult aspects of these explorations, is really accepting this. And here we have a wondrous observatory. This is supposedly the second oldest building on Syracuse University. And what exactly is this constructed out of? Some sort of advanced geopolymer? Well, what are your thoughts on this? So we're told that a number of technological innovations were required to complete the construction of the Erie Canal. And the one I want to focus on is the waterproof cement, as this is a very interesting exploration topic that alternative researchers come across a lot. The Romans had it, but then the world forgot how to make cement that could stand up to water. The secret was still a mystery when the Erie was being planned. And yet there's conflicting accounts on this because we're told that in Great Britain they actually had the mixture for this cement, but then other accounts say no they didn't, so make of it what you will. Builders had no idea where they would come up with this critical item to hold together stone locks and aqueducts, and you might recall the individual who came up with this was Canvas White. But here we have this account, this individual, Andrew Bartow, an educated farmer who lived along the route of the Erie Canal, began experiments with a type of limestone found near his home. Because, you know, I guess being a farmer, he just didn't have enough to do to occupy his time. And he just took extra time to experiment to innovate the cement because he knew they'd need waterproof cement to build the Erie Canal. It all makes perfect sense to me. By heating it to just the right temperature, he was able to produce a cement that would retain its hardness underwater. Rossendale cement. Cement from the same vein was used to build the Brooklyn Bridge more than half a century later, called Ken Burns. But yet, when we look at this account of Andrew A. Bartow, and remember this individual is just a farmer, here's what we have. In 1820, a patent for water lime, a hydraulic cement necessary for building locks, was issued to Canvas White, and that there is the Rossendale cement. And yet, here we're told, however, letters and documents exist that prove that Andrew Bartow deserved the recognition for this important discovery. To avoid the costly and time-consuming task of importing hydraulic cement from Europe, so you see, conflicting account, they're saying they already had the hydraulic cement from Europe, but then in the other account, they said, no, it needed to be in innovated and invented again. Well, which is it? He examined the limestone, he came up with a different kind of limestone, and then get this, he took it to Professor James Hadley at the medical college. Well, wait a minute. So a doctor is now an expert in innovating concrete and cement? 
So if I invent a new fuel efficient method for my car, I'm going to go talk to my dentist about it and he's going to certify it. And then the work will be confirmed that it's now perfect for use in cars because dentists are experts. Oh, wait a minute. This is the early 1800s where everybody's a polymath and everybody can be an engineer and an inventor. And I like this. Bartow informed the canal engineer, Canvas White. Remember, Canvas White was an amateur engineer. And White paid him $2,000, applied for, and was granted the patent. Bartow is to have a quarter interest in the patent. Little money was made by either man because others began to sell the water line without paying royalties. Oh, somebody always gets cheated. That's the real American story, isn't it? And finally, with uh, Bartow, they say this. In addition to his knowledge of construction farming, science, and education, he was specially qualified in legal matters to serve as a master of chancery, his name appearing on many county documents of his day. So, once again, everybody was an expert in everything, and that's exactly how we explain the mighty achievements in the United States and New York of the Erie Canal. What are your thoughts? Thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. I'd love to stay, but...